Hi, Pam. This is Virginia Rio. I just want to make sure you're here. Can you just say hello? Thank you, Pam. I know we're a little later. Um, if if um, we're not giving you enough time, we'll, we can give you a few minutes over. Um, I'm going to be the slide advancer, so please just tell me when you want the slides moved. Um, and um, I will also help monitor questions in the room. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay. All right. You ready to roll? Okay. We're going to... I'm going to... I'm here. Okay, it's all yours. You just say, next slide. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Pam Banning, a medical laboratory scientist turned data analyst and a longtime volunteer to LOIN. Uh, if we haven't met before, I am happy to welcome you all to our little corner of the laboratory of LOIN. Um, this committee, I'm, I'm glad to see those that were able to join this morning. Um, our medical scientists, both commercial and private-based, PhDs, engineers, in vitro diagnostic manufacturers, health information exchange developers, coding analysts, medical lab directors, pathologists, um, veteran informaticists. And, and the regular committee is composed of people from France, Spain, Canada, and the United States of America. We are always looking for other people to help participate with us. Next slide. So one example of industry collaboration under our accomplishments, um, several of us are also members of SHIELD, uh, the committee that Marjorie mentioned at the round table. Uh, and it was kind of like a member of SHIELD knew a member of MDIC who was also SHIELD, who then knew the National Kidney uh, foundation was working on some new uh, calculations that were not, uh, or rather EGFRs that were not race-based uh, in their methodology, and we wanted to just formulate the correct LOIT code for those. So that was um, very interesting. Um, several of our committee members also uh, reviewed the first edition of the new mapping guides for allergy, cell markers, chemistry, drug toxicology, hematology, serology, and molecular pathology. They, they were all released in September of 2022. And I'm seeing in the comments that some people are not seeing slides. These would be virtual people. I'm seeing them. Um, we'll check on that here. here. Okay, we thank you for telling us that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. We're always on the lookout for additional volunteers, as I mentioned. Um, we did have uh, new members gained in this last year. Uh, we meet on most thir Thursdays at 9 a.m. Eastern, so it's afternoon in Europe. Um, and as everyone should recognize, neglect of recruiting new members to the committee um, will be harmful in the long run. It's going to be attrition and illness. And so I'm very glad that the public meeting stands as one of the prerequisites, or at least it used to be, um, to becoming a member of the committee. So anyone who's in the audience is now welcome to the committee. <laughs> um, if we've struck your interest in the last, in these next 30 minutes, just let us know. Myself or Reagan. So, so as far as work underway, um, one terminology left the semi-quantitative scale back in 1998, but with technolo technological advances over the last 24 years and witnessing repository data over the last two decades, the committee agreed with Dr. McDonald that it was time for a new review. And so there will be discussion after this update slide, and the floor will be open for everyone's comments. Uh, as far as the six-month objectives go, um, Dr. McDonald noted during the roundtable uh, session before lunch that flow cytometry markers are a mess. And when we ask our commercial reference labs in the United States um, if their members, uh, if they all had their flow cytometry covers uh, needs covered, we got a resounding yes. Um, however, um, 3M during a project mapping a clinical trials lab, that they all all they did was clinical trials. 
Uh, we found that they had their needs not met um, at a rate of over 2,000 uh, data points, um, no loan terms. So we did some investigation, uh, Clem and I behind the scenes, and have identified a special cell immunology association that uses flow cytometry in their clinical practices for a variety of intricate immunological measures on the cell surfaces. Uh, and that is using clinical trials as well as in clinical practice. And so we've now identified some US-based uh, subject matter experts in flow cytometry and hope to start meeting in late spring of 2023. Um, after hearing everyone at the round table this morning, I'm really hoping that possibly we can identify some flow cytometry experts in Europe as well uh, for a more well-rounded opinion on, on development. Uh, that's a slide. So um, that's just one thing. I think we've work. corrected the problem on everybody seeing the screen. If you're still having a problem, please put that in chat. Okay. Anyone want to put a new message in? Sounds like we're good. Yeah. synopsis of the need and the issues and I'm not meaning to throw a wrench into the works but the lab committee feels that it's very important the, to know when a number is not given from a linear spectrum um, this is important for um, calculations and algorithms that they should not be performing uh, automatically when an absolute numeric value is not being provided because it's nonlinear um, and I'll apologize in advance if your head spins just a little bit on these next few slides, but as my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Dr. Swapna Abhyankar told me when I started undertaking this, if this was easy, it would have already been done. <laughs> Can I <go> next slide? <laughs> so looking at the options, of course we could keep our head in the sand and do nothing, um, but then we're, we've got, we're allowing continued misrepresentation of absolute numeric values, and we're blurring the lines between linear and nonlinear um, values, which should not be done. Um, we could do something, and we, the committee has been talking around the lines of addressing it as a semi-quant scale, re-looking back at that, which would allow us then to separate with a different scale um, discrete, discrete linear values from non-discrete range values, and then the, that enables math to become trusted and enabled. Um, the, the cons are also many, as you know, over decades people have been adopting without uh, a semi-quant scale. So it's one, it's hard to redesign, and two, uh, implementing is more work for users, and work is a four-letter word, uh, and the idea of the communication channels um, can be overwhelming. So we're seeking the opinions of, uh, for either side or any idea um, and any supporting evidence that you might be able to collect. Um, I asked Reagan Street to put in links to some of our past conversations, uh, which Isa has done so well. Thank you. Next slide. Pam, would you like to have people in the audience um, comment on this issue right now or just um, may I may I scope it out just a little bit? Okay. More? Are they are they biting at the bit? No, 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 no. I, my my um, my deck here is not correct. Keep going. Tell me when you're ready for input. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when we started, when the committee started, um, the test strips were an easy thought to begin with, because the design from the manufacturer is twofold. They can either be reported as ordinal, as you'll see down that middle column, uh, the neg, normal, <coughs> negative, 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 so on, or they can be kind of a quantitative, semi-quantitative, with the color changes indicating a specific concentration, either in milligrams per deciliter or millimoles per liter. Um, but as for the urobilinogen, matching the colors, you would be doing 2, 4, 8, and 12, that she wouldn't be reporting out three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, or eleven. Although those of you who've read these know that sometimes you can get a um, uh, a color that's in between the two. So 
it's easy to um, see that, that we're arranging these, and so the term of buckets or binning um, has been kind of tossed around to examine that the, <coughs> the numbers that are being reported look like an absolute number, but the way that they were measured really is more of just meeting a certain threshold before going to the next one. And I have a couple of other examples for you. Now, LOINT covers both of these scenarios perfectly. If uh, the pathologist or the medical director decides that the dipstick will be read and, and reported out as negative normals, negative positives, um, then there's the presence threshold towards LOINTs. And if the, another medical director or pathologist decides that they're going to be reported out in a semi-quantitative scale, then there are also LOINTs for those. Um, let's see. So some of this I'm going to be reading from is from Dr. Martin, and I don't think I saw it showing today, but um, Dr. Michael Martin um, wrote the, the binning uh, document that if you go to the uh, Google Docs links, you'll read, which is a very eloquent statement that the entire uh, committee uh, immediately wanted to paste into the user's guide but we're just still, still trying to decide how we're going to do this. So when, um, let's see if we got that. The other example on the screen is the, um, the reverse transcript phase um, PCR with the, the cycle threshold yeah. values. Should I advance the slide here? Would you like me to advance the slide? Or is it still on no, this one? No, you're fine because I'm referring to right what underneath test strips, the RT-PCR and the CT stands for cycle threshold. Those are often reported out with interpretation. Um, it would be inappropriate to treat these values as true quantitative data. But there is still some value uh, in the continuous numerical values. Some data are only approximations of underlying true quantitative values. The most correct way to report these would be as a most likely value, uh, plus a, a measure of random error. But that would be complicated and slow to use in most clinical settings. Go ahead and advance the slide, Virginia. So then, not to pick on anyone, but I always turn to our trusted commercial vendors at uh, reference labs in the United States who also sit on the link uh, committee. And I have a couple of examples um, from them. We started to look at the use of just the semantics of the word. And uh, one of the laboratories has a semi-quantitative total antibody for SARS-CoV-2. Go ahead and advance the slide. That they have tied to, um, and you can read the description of what's there. So it says qualitative and semi-quantitative detection of antibodies to the RBD domain. Go ahead and advance the slide. But then the length that's chosen is to a quantitative detection. So, and this is not this is not unique, and this is not an error. <coughs> this is just trying to make the best use of what we have available. Go ahead and advance the slide. So we found that you can look in any corner of the world, and everyone's got a different opinion on. Um, semi-quantitative, um, there's been expression that, you know, to, if we could just simply all understand the word semi-quantitative the same, that would, that would be well, that would be wonderful, but it's not there at the moment. And we're finding some ingestors of secondary use of data that they piece apart, they take apart uh, the attributes separately, and they're collating uh, data based on the scale of quantitative. And then the answer that's coming to them is, um, is tripping them up. Um, this, this is in direct reference to a public health situation. So we first went, because we would love to align to the FDA and, and their exact um, definitions. Um, so we looked into that. And they had lab result types of quantitative, semi-quantitative, qualitative, and non-quantitative. Um, another laboratory had, uh, going back to the public health, uh, Quest Diagnostics had sometimes experienced problems with certain states in the United States when sending the public health uh, electronic 
uh, lab reports on some of the of Quest semi-quantitative tests. And it was more for like the antibody tests like we saw for LabCorp than the urinalysis tests, um, probably because urinalysis doesn't necessarily go to public health. Um, but she suspected that there's a way of having the LOICs identify semi-quantitative tests in the lab ELRs would be helpful to public health agencies, clinicians, and possibly some of the state algorithms as well. Um, then we thought, being in the US, we thought of CLSI, Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. We thought, well, they'll have the definition for us. And so uh, I'll just let you know that semi-quantitative assay is essentially a qualitative assay with an additional option for the response range. Ordinal data are also referred to as semi-quantitative data. Um, the definition for the term semi-quantitative is similar to the definition for quasi-quantitative. Somebody can let me know if there's any eye rolling going on yet. There's a bit of giggling. <laughs> Now this one is going to um, push your knowledge a little bit, but, but I love to do that. I love to take issues and make education opportunities out of them. So here we have a uh, a new, line, a fairly new line code for 24-hour predicted protein based on uh, a random urine by calculation. Now this is a chemistry analyte. It's protein, right? And it's quantitative. Right, it's because it's got MRAT as a range, or MRAT as part of the property. But notice that it's not a ordinal. Some of the other, um, and like the numeric concentration, I think I might have inverted slides, but there's a numeric concentration range that is ordinal instead of quantitative, even though NCNC is usually quantitative. So this one rests well as an MRAT range and quantitative. So why does that not appear as linear? Just seeing if anybody wants to take a gander, I'll watch the chat. And if you need a hand, take a look at the term description, which is the first set of blue font, that banner and the sentence right below that. Okay, well, I'm going to jump ahead. I don't want it to be too painful. Um, th this is a prediction. You can see from the analyte name, it's 24-hour predicted protein. This isn't an actual number um, gained from an instrument. It's actually a calculation. If you read the term description, they took the protein measurement and they took the osmolality measurement of a random urine sample, and then they, they made a ratio of those. Um, and then they made a normal, kind of, well, not a normal range, but a predicted range of how that would go. So there are other, as I mentioned, there's other range properties in LOINC that will also stay quantitative. Here's question number two. Can anybody name any other uh, range property that is correct in standing at quantitative? Uh, date range is a continuous uh, a continuous calendar cycle, so that's not cut up into buckets. Uh, and also time stamp range, uh, when a timed incubation step is required in a laboratory specimen processing. It's the time of the actual start of the incubation and to the end. So those are not things that would be um, considered. Go ahead and advance that slide. Here's that inverted one. When this first came to light, um, in LOINC, quantitative is defined as linear, and ordinal is defined as nonlinear, and the assays that were created um, were ranges of copies of nucleic acid material. So in order to keep these numbers separate, um, so there's the example answer list, uh, the LOINC committee had agreed with Reagan Street to have a combination of numeric concentration range to a scale of ordinal. It just slows down those 
um, types of systems that are taking apart the attributes of LOINC and, um, or the fully defined term um, and trying to start taking action on them. I think that's a slide. All right, titers are something that we are going to consider because, and if you've done laboratory work, you'll recognize that serial dilution taking place in the, in the diagram where you start with one uh, concentration and you've got diluent in each of the subsequent tubes and you slowly transfer a measured amount from tube one to tube two, mix it well, distribute something from tube two to tube three and on and on so that the readings on these tubes are actually these buckets or this binny. So a particular titer means um, like one to eight means it's it's greater than or equal to one to eight, but it didn't make it to one to 16. Now, another thing that was in here, let's see. Uh, newer methods such as immunoassays, measuring antibody and antigen levels produce numerical values such as optical density ratios, but convert those to tighter values via BINI in the reporting algorithms. And this conversion keeps the reported value in the familiar terms, but also helps prevent over-reliance on the precise optical density ratio values that may not be directly proportional to the exact level of the analyte. Anybody still awake in there? <laughs> okay, let's, um, just one, I think it's only one more slide, and then we're gonna open the floor. So, operationally, if we, do decide to make some sort of change to help keep nonlinear values segregated from absolute linear values, um, there's going to have to be some operational process changes. And um, uh, Xavier Ganzel, I haven't seen him yet in the crowd, but I've been looking for him, um, uh, came up with um, a, very, a very succinct uh, idea that we needed to develop a clear decision matrix. We've got to decide if we're going to implement a change, when is a modification big enough to switch from just being a part update where uh, codes are only updated to code deprecation and replacement. And this would need to be formalized and uh, to prevent unneeded discussions in politics. And of course, the rule may evolve over time. It needs to be traceable. So it, you know, it's a change management uh, decision and it's, it's a really good one. And I'm not certain at this point that Reagan Street, uh, the, the LOINC developers um, have that firmly ironed out. And it's my understanding that you know they're looking for a little assistance from us as well. Of course, there are many other, um, many other considerations operationally in how this would be, trying to size up the uh, amount of change. So the committee did some initial polls of potential sources for properties, method, methods, classes, just to try and see within the database of blank codes, and we were using version 2.73 to evaluate you know, how big of a change could this be for historical use uh, and for having to uh, make education of, of the change out to the public. Um, we also realized that maybe there's a different solution. Um, and so we're looking over to that. Um, we noted that HL7 offers multiple ways to report, and Reagan Street gives different LOINC terms appropriately. Do we need to consider more about HL7? It's an open-ended question. Um, is it reported like a combination, this is from Andrea, of OBX5 and OBX8, or maybe two OBX5s? Um, but in any regard, what we are trying to tackle right now and hope to have resolved soon so we could start um, working on the operational process is to agree on a semi-quantitative definition, uh, evaluate the existing links for inclusion, um, update the user's guide content, um, get that clear, concise decision matrix created, um, and provide Reagan Street with guidance on new submissions uh, that are quantitative to make certain that the correct scale is assigned. Next slide. So we're gonna open the floor and somebody can tell, tell me how much time is left out of we're, ours. We're down to you two know, minutes, you, you, sadly. <laughs> um, but let, let's just see, are there pressing questions? Yes. 
Okay. If your voice isn't heard today, please uh, jot down the list, the mm -hmm. listserv there, and we won't be discussing it again until December. I th Thank you. Um, any pressing questions? I'm going to do a quick poll of those who are, you know, feel this is a, your stakeholder in this one way or another, no matter how you're engaged with Loy, how many feel this would be a valuable issue to wrestle to the ground because you can see it's complicated and it is going to take some effort. This isn't a vote just to get a sense. Are, is there a strong, can you raise your hand if you think that, Pam, go forward. <laughs> Oh, higher. I think I can't count. One, two, three, four, five. What is it? April in the back? All the way up so we can see your hand. Six, seven, eight. We've got, Pam, we've got about 10 people in the room. If you think yes and you're on the Zoom, can you just type yes into the Zoom? That'll give us a sense of at least the momentum that you would have if you were trying to tackle this, Pam. Um, so uh, when we when we brought this up, when Pam brought this up, she said, should I really discuss this? And we said, if, it's, if you think it's needed, then we're going to do it. So thank you, Pam. It's, you did such a thorough presentation here. Um, are, are you speaking? I'm sorry if I'm covering you. You're, you're on mute, Pam. You're... Huh? Just counting the chat. It's rolling and rolling. <laughs> it is. It is. And Clem has a question for Pam. Who has a question? Not a question, it's a compliment. You've done a terrific, fantastic job, as usual, in presenting this issue. Am I, am I on a speaker? Yes, yeah. you are. Yeah, so kudos. <laughs> kudos from Clem are think, always welcome. Thank think, you. <laughs> I think we should make a semi quantitative scale, but that's an aside. <laughs> Andrea, do you want to share your comment? Just going to mention a while ago with the clinical quality measures, I know Lisa from the clinical one, you know, works in this area too. There was discussion for the rebellion immunity, um, immunity fighters that in order to make them computerizable, that they were converted to decimal points. And I don't know if that's still the case, but um, so this does have um, widespread implications as well. Okay. Um, we want to allow time for uh, our other presenters. So, Pam, thank you so much. And I'm hoping you're going to get a lot of good feedback after this call. All right. um, I think, Ken, you are up next. And you wanted to present your slides. So we're not going to, you'll be advancing your own. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. All Can right. you guys see those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes, we can. Um, all right, so uh, I'm Ken Wang. I uh, chair the radiology committee, um, and I'll uh, give you some updates. I'm going to do a little bit of what Scott did earlier in terms of um, kind of giving some of the history of what we've done. Uh, I'm hoping that might be useful in context for this group. All right, so, um, so yeah, I'll spend some time talking about what we've done previously that has centered on collaboration between Regent Street and uh, organization called RSNA, which I also represent, which is one of the major um, imaging societies. Um, and um, I'll show you some examples of what interoperability in imaging means for us. And, um, and then I'll mention a couple of things that are uh, current initiatives, and we've already touched on uh, the AI results, and I'll say a little bit about that. All right, so starting uh, several years ago now, and this work was completed several years ago, uh, this collaboration between Regent Street and RSNA uh, led to some information modeling of imaging exams. And uh, that work is summarized and described at the back of the Boeing user guide, um, which uh, with every release, uh, when you go to the user guide, at the very end, uh, there's an annex, which I'm showing the front page of here, uh, which describes the information modeling that we did in that work. Uh, but I do want to give you a flavor of what interoperability means in imaging. Um, and so uh, I'm going to use an example, which is not a new example. Uh, a few of you uh, may have seen me uh, show this before, uh, but I think it is a useful example. And so um, that is the example of the American College of Radiology's Dose Index Registry. And so let me tell you what that is. <laughs> so um, starting a number of years ago, uh, the ACR um, was building a system to allow people to uh, do quality improvement around the radiation dose that was administered as part of uh, CT imaging. 
So every time we do a CT exam, say for example, a CT of the head, uh, we get back dose information uh, related to the radiation administered during that exam. And uh, from a quality improvement perspective, it would be useful to be able to ask the question, well, how did I do with the radiation dose here? And did I give um, you know, a lot, a little bit, an appropriate amount, and how does this amount of radiation compare to other institutions? And so enter uh, the ACR Dose Index Registry. And uh, what this is, it's a, it's a registry that collects information um, about CT-based radiation from hospitals um, around the US and potentially from some international hospitals as well. Periodically, uh, participants will get these reports, and these reports are simply lists of exams, uh, CT exams, and some associated statistics about radiation dose. So if we look specifically at a line for non-contrast CT of the head, um, <coughs> these uh, fields to the right um, show, for example, that uh, they give some statistics about what radiation dose do as one specific institution administered as part of non-contrast CT head. So here's the mean and the standard deviation, et cetera, for your radiation dose for this type of exam, as compared to those same statistics for other groups of uh, institutions in the registry. That might be institutions in your particular geographical region. It might be institutions in a kind of a, a similar practice type, type of category, for example, academic institutions, um, and also uh, comparison with uh, institutions across the entire registry. So um, the concept is quite simple. It's really just that we want to kind of take our doses and compare them to those of others. And so um, at the outset of this project, uh, they started to collect information from some pilot institutions and they started to get exams. And the way that these exams were identified were by their names. And those names were non-standard, and um, so they started to get back names that look like this. Um, head, carrot, head, underscore, W-O, adult, um, brain, W-O-C-T, um, and, and uh, kind of these kinds of names. And, and um, if any of you has spent five minutes at a CAT scan console, which for your sake, I hope perhaps you haven't, um, you, you, you know that this is what the world looks like in terms of how exams are named. So from a set of 60 uh, pilot sites, um, they got back a, a list of names that consisted of about 200, 224 distinct um, non-standard uh, names for this one kind of exam, uh, non-contrast CT head, when in fact what they really want is they want just like a single way to refer to all of these things, for example, 0.30799. Um, and so this is, this is like an ugly long list, but I would also say that the complexity of this problem is um, at least several orders of magnitude beyond what I'm showing here, because uh, remember that this is for a single kind of exam. We're talking about one line of this report. Um, and this report, uh, the, the number of CT exams that a typical hospital might have might be, say, 100 different kinds of exams. So that's a couple of orders of magnitude more there. And then also remember that this list came from a small sample of hospitals of 60 uh, facilities. I think the dose index registry now has maybe about 1,500 hospitals, and so there's maybe another order of magnitude or two uh, there. So, um, so um, interoperability uh, allows us to uh, do this kind of um, apples to apples comparison for the purpose of radiation dose. So just to give some examples, kinds of codes that, uh, that that work produce. Well, so uh, here's the code for non-contrast CT head. Uh, here's a code for AP X-ray view pelvis. Here's a code for non-contrast MRI of the brain. Here's a code for non-contrast MRI of the left knee. And here's a code for a uh, CT of the chest with IV contrast. So with this uh, example, the CT of the chest, um, I'd like to show another example of what interoperability relation can mean. And uh, that relates to the concept of relevant priors. This is something that on a kind of a practical day-to-day -day, uh, basis for um, clinical radiologists, this is something that we think about with every case that we would open. The idea of being something that, well, if I'm opening a, um, a 
contrast CT of the chest, and I see, for example, uh, if I were to see a, a lung nodule on the scan like this, um, and I certainly want to know uh, whether that's something new, whether it's been seen on previous imaging studies, whether it's growing, um, et cetera. And so I need to be able to find any prior imaging that might show this same character. And um, this, as you wouldn't be surprised, is kind of this, the same problem as the dose index registry problem. So historically, um, with exams being identified by idiosyncratic non-standard names, you might be looking for other exams, other different flavors, uh, CT exams of the chest. This set, which I just made up, doesn't look too bad. Um, but then you might be looking for other kinds of names that might look like this. Or, uh, uh, in the name, different physician names of the patient. Or here's a CT of the chest for pulmonary embolism evaluation. It's a very abbreviated kind of shorthand for PE study of the chest or uh, cardiac CTA. Um, and then you might also be looking for other kinds of exams still, uh, which um, might image uh, the lungs by virtue of being adjacent to some other area. So if you did a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, you typically are imaging parts of the lung bases, and that would be relevant for a situation like this. Or similarly, if you are imaging the, the neck, uh, you typically image portions of the lung bases. Again, that could be useful as a relevant prior. Um, and so, um, and as, actually, to carry that maybe one step further, um, not only are these names idiosyncratic and hard to predict, um, they also evolve over time. And so during COVID, uh, of institutions may have developed new exam protocols for, uh, targeted at detecting COVID-19. And as some of you may be aware, uh, in 2022, there was a worldwide shortage of IV contrast, and so people were also modifying their exams uh, related to that contrast shortage, and there might be specific imaging studies uh, named in that way. And so, um, again, this is no surprise to this group, but uh, the, the bottom line is that um, looking at names like this to achieve a semantic uh, purpose is um, essentially bound to fail. And so with the uh, LOINC radiology information model, what we have instead is we have a, a description of these exams based on attributes. These attributes uh, consist of things like the imaging modality, which is CT in this case, uh, the anatomic region, uh, chest in this example, um, information about contrast that may have been given, including the group that it was given by. And so with these attributes then, <coughs> Instead of having to do, um, you know, looking at idiosyncratic names, to find relevant priors, you can do a computation to find relevant priors. And so that is, you can uh, say, well, show me all the LOINC codes which have modality CT and anatomic location thorax. Um, that will automatically capture all such exams, including exams that may be added over time that you didn't know about when you uh, kind of devised that computation. You can also do things like, uh, we can look at other modalities. You might say, well, I would like to also see radiographs of the chest and do a similar computation for that. And you can also find those adjacent body regions, abdomen and neck. Um, again, by doing a computation, uh, which just makes this um, systematic and repeatable and sustainable rather than brittle, brittle and bound to fail. Um, so anyway, that's the second example of what interoperability can mean for imaging. All right, so that is kind of where we've been with the radiology committee and the work that we've done and this collaboration between Regan Street and us. In terms of things that we are looking at, um, something that we have uh, started to dig into in some depth is uh, the need to kind of go one level down in terms of the detail of imaging exams. Everything I've showed you so far has to do with the, the exam as a whole. Um, many kinds of imaging exams uh, consist of different parts or components, and um, there is a need to uh, standardize the way that we refer to those components, which I'm calling a series and sequences. We've already talked a little bit today about AI results, and um, that certainly relates to imaging um, based on imaging as a source of uh, data for uh, AI algorithms. And we've also looked a little bit about expanding um, the coverage of interventional radiology procedures. So let me give you a little bit more uh, detail about two of these things. So in terms of series and sequences, um, this is essentially what I just said, but again, series and sequences um, constitute the components or elements of imaging exams. And as of 
as of today, there is no standard way to refer to series and sequence. So um, here's an example of that. So if we come back to this CT of the chest image, again, we have a, a standard code to refer to CT of the chest with IV contrast. What we don't have is we don't have a standard way to refer to the fact that this is a series of axial images obtained at 50 seconds after the injection contrast using three millimeter slice thickness and also using a lung reconstruction current. Um, so there is no standard way to do that. Um, and so this raises a few questions and I was really interested to uh, hear Pam's uh, presentation and also Stan touched on this issue also. Um, some of the attributes of series and sequences uh, could well be kind of described using this numerical versus ordinal uh, division. And so one example of that um, is shown here. And so this is a, a, an axial image through the abdomen. Um, and um, oftentimes with, with contrast and CT, uh, we'll obtain images at different times for different purposes. And so here, this is a, a, an image that was obtained at a certain time in order to optimally opacify the portal vein here. Um, but you could talk about that timing both in a, a numerical way. Uh, many sites might use the delay of 70 seconds uh, to achieve portal vein opacification. Um, or you could talk about it in more of a uh, descriptive way. You could call this a portal venous phase image. Um, Another way in which this numerical versus ordinal uh, question comes up here is in the issue of slice thickness. And so um, here I've said that this is a five millimeter uh, slice thickness. Um, other people might prefer to refer to this subjectively or qualitatively as a thick image. Um, now you might wonder, um, it, does, it, does it really matter this difference between numeric versus ordinal in these cases? And I would say it can matter um, here are two, two reasons why this could be relevant for people. One is that um, different institutions with different scanners and different equipment might consider different numerical numbers to qualify as portal venous or something else. And so portal venous doesn't mean the same thing to all users. Um, and um, a, another um, issue is that um, similarly, uh, what is considered a thick slice versus a thin slice might have different meanings to different people and for different uses. Uh, so one example of that is that if we were to go back to the image of the chest, um, oftentimes, or depending on who you ask, um, readers will often wish to look for lung nodules using slice thicknesses of a certain thinness. So you'd like to use thinner slices to look for small lung nodules. Um, some sites might consider two millimeter slices to be thin for the purposes of looking for small lung nodules. On the other hand, if you're doing something totally different with the images, if you're looking to do um, 3D printing, um, then a thin slice image will have to be smaller than two, two millimeters, and often you would like those slices to be one millimeter or thinner. Um, so anyway, that, that's just an example of how um, the qualitative descriptors might have different meanings to different users. Um, and so if we pause here for a second, I think again, like thinking about what I heard during Pam's presentation, and Pam, thank you so much for that. Um, I think I heard several things, uh, which were that, um, you know, there are different ways to approach this. Um, and, um, you know, one might be, well, just, just encode the number. So just put 70 seconds in there and let, let people decide for themselves. Um, another might be, well, to just use the qualitative descriptor and um, allow people to apply those as they see fit. Um, some other ideas that I heard in Pam's talk were that, well, you know, we might be useful to um, define ranges or bins, um, and so uh, that might relate here. Um, or perhaps, uh, I don't think uh, anyone said this, but um, I don't know if this is a, a horrible idea, but you, you might also consider rounding these numbers. Um, and so here I would like to pause and you know, I, I guess to parallel some of the issues that Pam posed. I wonder if people A, have questions about the context that I presented or B, um, thoughts about um, this ordinal versus numerical issue that I'm posing. Okay, Ken, I'm gonna try to see if we have hands coming up in the room. Is this an issue that you've dealt with in any of your work? Could you raise your hand? Wow. 
we do not have any hands up, Ken. <laughs> um, but if it is and you're on the Zoom, would you please put that into chat? That would be helpful to us. It looks like you're breaking some new ground here, Ken. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about this at all? Since I, I doesn't sound like you have experience with it. Have you? No. Oh, we have a um, Dan. I can. This is Dan. This is, of course, great work and infinitely fascinating. I, I know there will be. This will be the first of many uh, rabbit holes you go down uh, in this venture. But it does strike me that for both this question and subsequent ones, um, gathering as much as you can a set of example uh, series descriptors from various institutions might be helpful to get some. Uh, sense of the patterns and how frequent these various patterns exist. So you may already have access to that or have seen them, but I'm thinking that you might want to refer to the, the commonality of different approaches um, at various points. For this one, um, I don't have any specific uh, recommendations, but um, I think that I would lean towards starting with the um, uh, with the quantitative approach for this uh, slice thickness, for example, and the timing, um, because, it, and then the main question there would be, to what extent would you want to um, imply or infer a range around whatever uh, number is listed there? Um, and then, at least at that level, other folks could, uh, you know, apply later their um, qualitative things. But since you do have those, I mean, they're defined as part of, um, the, the workflow, that seems to be at least a, a better starting point. Thank and, and I appreciate that comment, and I think that that does make a lot of sense in terms of um, understanding kind of what the, the, the practical state of current practice is. Um, we are in the process of doing some of that. We've actually done something which is maybe not quite the same as that. We've gone to one particular institution. At BCSF, they've done a lot of um, initial work to try and develop their own internal standard for series and sequence naming. And um, we've tried to kind of draw on uh, decisions that they've made, or at least see um, some of the questions that they've come across, um, <clears throat> and use that to uh, develop a, um, a, a set of uh, common examples of series and sequence names that would be relevant for people. But that's not what you're saying, because you're suggesting that we um, go and collect um, different examples from different institutions to kind of see uh, what the variation is and, and whether there are patterns. Um, so I think that's a good example or a good suggestion and certainly we can do that. Um, I will also add that um, in terms of having a preference to lean towards quantitative numbers, I, I, see, I, I definitely see an appeal to doing it that way. One challenge is that some of these numbers can be slightly different. Uh, what we're lacking here is, um, well, actually, maybe we're suffering a consequence here. Um, Cam was showing some examples of test strips where I guess a, a test vendor has defined certain ranges or numbers that are uh, valid for a certain test. Um, and what is true in imaging is that if we talk about slice thickness, that the slice thicknesses can be different, but only slightly different, depending on the vendor of a um, CT scanner, for example. So one scanner might produce 0.625 images, another scanner might produce 0.7 images, another one would produce 0.5 images. And um, so there is a potential for um, kind of ha having an explosion of those minute differences uh, for that reason. Did I see any other hands in the room? April, am I missing any hands? Uh, Andrea has some comments if she would like to share those. Oh, yes. Exactly the same, but um, kind of a related area in LOINC um, in lab. Um, I did put a LOINC code 33271-8 for thin smear of malaria. Um, the, in the laboratory, there are thick and thin smears. They're not necessarily measured like you do in radiology per se, but when you think about things too, like oil immersion, um, microscopy, and things, um, that gets into more magnification, which gets into kind of a similar parallel, but again, you're not listing the magnification other than the, the year analysis result um, LOINC codes where they have high and low magnification. They don't get it the exact, you know, it's 40x, 10x, that sort of thing. So it's, 
it's close but not exactly the same. So I'll just mention that. And that's interesting to hear. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, I'll be curious to take a look at some of those and um, if we think that, that could be useful for us. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I guess just to build on what Dan was saying, I think it would be really helpful to, you know, sort of do a survey of different hospitals or hospital systems and see how they're reporting. And if it turns out 90% of them are doing, you know, reporting it quantitatively, then, you know, sort of push the other 10% to report the same way. But, you know, trying to get a baseline, because maybe it'll turn out 90% are actually saying thick and thin versus reporting the number. Um, so that was one thing. Um, and then I've actually been communicating uh, with Jamie and she suggested that, you know, if we do make some of these terms, we could actually attach them to all of the radiology codes as associated observations. So you could actually report this information with the appropriate uh, code. Um, and then the third piece is what you just said about, you know, different manufacturers having slightly different, like the 0.625 and, you know, 0.5. So that wouldn't be an explosion of codes because that would just be the result, right? So the basically the line code would be for slice thickness and then it would just be whatever slice thickness is appropriate in that particular situation would be reported. So, it, you know, it would potentially be an explosion of result values, but not of the line codes themselves. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting point. And thanks for mentioning that, Swapna. Um, what I'm presenting here, which is not necessarily the way it needs to be, Okay, yeah, and I didn't realize that you were presenting like a pre-coordinated model, so. Um, so Ken, yeah. we, we are at time, and um, I, I, did you have additional questions that you wanted to pose the group? We can ask, we can figure out a way to get a response uh, outside the meeting, or was this? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just make one other comment, which mm -hmm. uh, is to emphasize Thanks, Ken. I think you had a slide about um, when the meetings are. Did you? Yes. Okay. Right. So we have a tentative plan to hold monthly meetings at the end of each month coming up in 2023. Uh, the details of that are still pending, though. So um, I guess folks that are interested uh, can contact staff for uh, more information. Going forward. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, next, we're going to hear from nursing. Lisa, did, are you here? Yay! You're all, okay. I'm ready. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. Oh, we need to go back to the slide deck, our slide deck here. <laughs> or not. Are you advancing the slides, Virginia? Yeah, I, I, I have to wait till they come up. Yes, but yes, if, I, if you're ready and I didn't do it, you let me know. Okay. Well, while we're getting that set up, my name is Lisa Anderson. I'm a nurse by background. I've worked in informatics since 2008-ish, doing implementation um, at hospitals and uh, occupational health and primary care organizations across the country. Um, after that, I got into quality measurement. I worked at the Joint Commission, which is a large accreditation body in the United States for hospitals. Um, after that, I worked at NCQA, which is the HEDIS um, health plan measure developer. So I learned a lot about the payer um, measures that people use. 
and the structure and differences between that and our hospital-based measures. And now I currently work at Mathematica. We are a prime contractor for CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. It's the largest payer in the US, um, overseeing our um, electronic clinical quality measure uh, development and maintenance programs used for uh, payment reform and value-based care. So that's a little bit about me. Um, moving on, um, I've been involved with, in, with LOINC since 2015, since I started in measure development at the Joint Commission. I really just wanted to learn what it was all about and got really excited about it. And we use um, LOINC codes in our, our elect electronic clinical quality measures. So they're a really important component to, the, um, to how we define those. Um, so since then, I became a co-chair. Um, I worked with Susan Matney, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, she was around uh, this block for a very long time. She retired last year. And now I co-chair with Randy Woodward, who is not here today, um, but he does, um, he does a lot of the work with me throughout the year. Okay, so some of our um, accomplishments um, over the last year, we did hold five um, nursing subcommittee meetings. We try to hold them monthly, but you know we're all volunteers. Um, and also when holidays come into the mix, we just cancel those meetings and don't reschedule them because everyone's schedules are so busy. Um, we collaborate a lot with the nursing knowledge, big data, um, big data science, uh, encoding and modeling work group. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about what that is. So this is a big informatics think tank that is surrounded around nursing and nursing data uh, that comes out of the University of Minnesota. Um, there is a annual conference in June and um, our encoding and modeling work group, we work, we are now combined with our modeling, our knowledge modeling work group who gets information from health systems from the ground up. For example, if we were looking to um, encode pain scales or um, genital urinary components, we get the ground up information from multiple, multiple health systems. That data is then analyzed, cleansed, standardized with that group who has, who have the boots on the ground and can ask real clinicians like, how are you using this data? What makes sense to you? What data do you actually need? Then that data comes to the encoding and modeling work group, which is my group <laughs> um, that I participate in. Um, in our group, we then map that data that we received from the organizations to existing LOINC and or SNOMED concepts. If we find gaps in the concepts, that's when we start the process to request new codes. Um, and that's how it ties into the LOINC nursing uh, committee because we take that information from that big group and help shepherd that through the process of um, requesting those, those concept requests through LOINC so that we make sure that we have the data elements really defined, explicitly defined, so that when we do submit it, we don't get a thousand questions from um, Regan Street. They're like, okay, yeah, we know what you're talking about. Um, and so we do a lot of collaboration between our two groups. We're really intertwined, um, but I wanted to give you that information so you understand how we kind of go through the process. Of course, other organizations um, can come to us with requests for codes. We work with a lot of um, nursing specialty societies like the Perioperative Nurses Association. Um, we work with EHR vendors, other folks. So we try to get all the right people in the room when we're talking about these concepts and thinking through not only how are we going to define this, but then how are we going to have it implemented in systems? And then from my perspective, I'm a quality measure. So my first question is, how are we gonna reuse that in a quality measure? And how we specify it really changes the way that we can um, reuse that information later in a quality measure to actually measure the value of that care. Um, so that's, that's how that works. Um, we also collaborated with um, the LOINC staff on defining reusability of answer list codes. So one of the things I talked about were pain scales. Well, there are pain scales specific to neonatal intensive care patients, pediatric patients, adult patients, but a lot of the concepts cross over. Um, and so we, we worked with them over the last few months about really looking at what those different scales are and which concepts we can actually reuse instead of recreating the wheel with every, every pain scale. So, um, and the way, the way that we determined to do that was say, well, well this concept is, can be generalizable across these things, but we understand what it means because it's connected to the whole panel for the pain scale that we're talking about. So that's how we keep those things connected. Um, and so that the context 
make sense as it gets transferred from person to person. Um, we also had an ad hoc meeting to discuss FedEx codes. I don't know if any of you have looked in LOINC and you're like, what does FedEx mean, right? Well, we had the same question. And so um, we worked with uh, the Regan C staff. They did, uh, you know, had a good discussion with some of our uh, members who had, you know, who are deep in implementation and had a lot of questions about it, wanted to know, can we use it? Should we use it? How do we use it? All those things. Um, so that was a great, lively discussion that happened um, and everyone came out with a mutual understanding of how to use it. Um, and then the LOINC staff also provided a, um, a document ontology overview for our group. Um, a lot of our nurses do work in implementation, so they just wanna understand how do all these different parts of LOINC work so that when they're doing implementation and mapping at their organizations, it, it works the way it's intended. Um, and then we also provided um, HIMSS, the Alliance for Nursing Informatics, and the Nursing, the Nursing Knowledge Big Data report outs. So that's that, um, that big data science that we are connected with. Uh, current work underway, and I think this actually happened last month, <laughs> was um, we were, the LOINC staff uh, did a demo of social determinants of health LOINC codes and how to use them. Um, this is really of high interest in the U.S. right now. I don't know if it's um, of high interest globally, but um, you know, LOINC has those terms grouped together. And so just kind of giving an overview of how it's organized in LOINC so that people can kind of pull that information and implement that in their systems was really, really helpful. Um, we have a few um, submissions underway. One is the CHAMPS fall risk assessment scale, a Humpty Dumpty fall risk scale, the nurses identifier. So um, in the U.S., every nurse who gets a license has a unique identifier that comes from nurses, and it's, it's, a cr it's unique across the board. So um, if you have a license in Indiana or Illinois or California and Hawaii, your nurse's number is the same in either state. Um, you might get a new license identifier for that actual state, but at a high level, that nurses identifier is, is stable across the board. Um, and what we're really trying to do with value-based care is do some attribution to different types of clinicians and really measure value of care. Um, so it's really important to get that submission in there so that we can start retrieving data that is attributed to nurses. And so if we have that nurses identifier, attached to the documentation that they're doing, we'll be able to start pulling that in the future um, and really show the value of nursing care. And then um, last but not least, we are working on a NIPS revision. So I believe NIPS was one of the, that's a neonatal um, infant pain scale. That was one of the early pain scales that we worked on and worked through. So, you know, we learned by trial and error. Um, and after we did that and started looking at like, oh gosh, we could probably reuse some of these, uh, some of these codes across the board. Um, that ties into this NIPS uh, revision that's going underway now. Um, over the next six months, uh, we are going to maintain alignment and support with the, the NKME work group. So our nursing knowledge, big data work group, that was the modeling and encoding work group, um, which was in which was two groups, we are now unified into one group. So the knowledge modeling and the encoding work groups are combined um, under that structure um, because we have a lot of back and forth with them. As we're doing the mapping, we have a lot of questions back to them um, and it just flows easier for all one group. Um, so that's why the acronym changed. We're um, also uh, working with our group to identify gaps in social determinants of health data elements. Um, quite a few of our members work on the Gravity Project through HL7. Um, we know Regan Streif has representation on the Gravity Project, so we're just trying to make sure that we're all staying in coordination and that if things are popping up as a gap um, in institutions, that that is getting brought forward into the right groups. Um, we're planning to host monthly meetings with the exception of um, when they fall on a holiday. Um, and there's a slide later that we'll talk about our meetings. Um, and also supporting the LOINC team in nursing related requests. So um, historically, we would kind of like have requests and throw them over the fence. Um, and there wasn't a lot of back and forth with the Regan Street team unless there was a critical question. Now we have a lot more collaboration. Um, they join our meetings. Um, we sometimes have ad hoc meetings with them to kind of discuss things preemptively before meetings so that we have a mutual understanding of what we're sharing with our group. Um, and it's really working well to have that, that bi-directional um, flow of information. So next slide, uh, skip that one, yep, okay. We don't have any um, high, hot topics to discuss. Uh, we kind of keep it, keep it moving in our monthly work groups. And that's what I wanna come to now. So our next monthly meeting should be um, in like next week, November 7th. 
They are held the first Monday of each month. Um, the exceptions are January, July, and September because those are the ones that do fall on holidays. Um, and these are free and publicly available meetings. So I know that we do have quite a bit of a time difference, um, but we encourage anyone to join these meetings and help provide um, more information um, that you have. Oh, go ahead. Am I at time? Okay, that you have, um, if you have questions about what we're currently doing, um, we really welcome anyone and everyone to join our group and help provide um, additional information uh, that you have related to nursing topics. Does someone have a question back there? Or, yes, we have a question online from John Snyder. Hi, John Snyder. Hey, Lisa, could you explain a little bit between the nurses ID versus the MPI ID for the National Provider Identifier? Yep. So the NPI ID, which is the National Provider Identifier, is for physicians. Um, the nurses do not get an NPI, um, so that's that's why we have separate um, separate identifiers. Does that help, John? It does. Thank you. I thought nurses were required to have an NPI. Uh, nope. <laughs> Clem. Very great, very good presentation, and a lot of good. Uh, dynamics in it, and I, you probably talk faster than I do too. I just, <laughs> but um, I've had a lot of coffee today, but, Clem. Yeah, but the, yeah, I know what you mean. I did too. But the NPI is available for nurses as well as physicians as well as taxi drivers, anybody who bills. Now, if they don't bill, then it's a problem. That may be the issue. Right. So that's the issue. Nurses do not bill for their care, yeah. um, at least in the U.S. Okay. And so nurses do not have an NPI um, associated with their licenses. The, the one standard unification is the nurse's ID, which is why we went with that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And I just wanted to make a quick comment. I wanted to thank this nursing group for the tremendous amount of work that they do. Um, they really are doing a lot of work out there and keeping us ahead of what we should be looking at, especially with the pain scales, um, the nurse ID number. And I believe that only nurse practitioners have an NPI, right? Yes, because they have prescribing capabilities and billing capabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. It was great. All right, Rob, you hanging in there with us? <laughs> No, no break. You, you, are, you are the end of the day. Um, we'll probably have some closing remarks, but uh, I, I, have a, I have a closing thing, but it'll be quick, I promise. So, uh, Rob, the floor is yours. Let me okay. get your slide there. Does everybody feel like that? that I, it's definitely long, but I'll, I'll not fall asleep while I'm up here at least, so that's good. <laughs> Um, so I appreciate everybody staying, those of you that have stayed. Um, so the, I'm uh, Rob McClure. I'm uh, a physician informaticist that got roped into being the chair of the document ontology group. And, um, and actually, it's been a lot of fun. Um, the, this group, I think, has a very unique kind of charge in LOINC, which is we're going to get to in a, in a second here, and that it's somewhat different from what clinical LOINC and lab LOINC does. Um, I think it's a little, uh, it, 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 it's, it's off in a corner in the sense that we're trying to capture information about documents. And so it doesn't, and you, I, I'm sure you've all looked at that, it doesn't have that same kind of structure. And so we've had to massage what we do into the structure that is LOINC, which I think raises some issues about, you know, the, the end result of how we identify documents. That being said, I think it's pretty clear that identifying documents with a type is um, is extremely valuable. At least the world seems to think it's valuable because they keep coming and asking for more, and um, and they are in regulations, and so we're going to need to keep doing them. Um, uh, so with that, I and and unfortunately, I don't have any other uh, folks that that are co-chairs, uh, but we do have a small but pretty solid uh, group of people who continue to come to the meetings. Um, so what did we accomplish uh, in 2022? The same sort of stuff that most people do, which is we, there are these requested additions. We walk through those. 
Um, actually don't know the total number that we added, but at times it's long or, or short, at times it's big. And in fact, this past year, we had a big chunk because we were trying to separate the um, different kinds of documents that had been kind of merged to, together. I won't go into all that detail, but it, well, actually it's the second point. So we separated out um, progress notes because of the idea of a progress note and what it was typically associated with and the, the, the fact that that had kind of been lumped together inpatient and outpatient. And so based on requests um, from a, a couple of different organizations, we ended up separating those out. So if you followed this, you will see that there's a lot more notes because we had, it's one of those uh, combinant, combinatorial explosion things and we had to create a lot of uh, uh, mostly outpatient notes, I think. Um, we also added synoptic reports. You kind of heard a little bit about that but, um, in a prior discussion. And um, we identified some diagnostic reports that uh, are used by the FDA. And, um, and, you know, this does boil down to this issue about there's a lot of folks who want to have a single code that represents their document so they can find it. And, and that means there's a lot of complexity in terms of what that document identifier is supposed to represent. Um, so work underway. We, we get, you know, ongoing requests, so we'll continue to do that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of kind of angst with regards to correctly identifying the documents that fall into a subgroup that are associated with, in particular in the United States, CCDA. But there are also uh, subsets that are generally used for CDA because that's the real that's the way CDA. And in fact, I, I suspect many of you understand that that the, this is all driven by CDA. I mean, I don't know that we get a lot of requests for document identifiers that are associated with other um, standards. Actually, I haven't ever asked that question before, so maybe somebody in here might know that. But but it's certainly CDA, and so um, so there's this lockstep process with CDA and the use of CDA and the creation of new rec and new uh, standards using CDA artifacts and then the need to identify something quite specific associated with that. Um, so we also had some mini uh, projects to, to clean up some of the structures and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second um, because of this intersection and I'm going to challenge you to for example just Maybe we'll get some kind of sense as to the differences between subject matter, domain, role, and some of these other things because they do mentally overlap. And we are um, basically, our job is to kind of mentally disentangle these. We don't have any, you know, uh, we don't get lab information with separate fields that we can look at to try and kind of say, well, these things are actually distinct. This is all up in our head, unfortunately. So six month objectives is to continue to do that. Um, you know, spend some time on this uh, clarification of these different these different uh, axes, so that we can do a better job when we're asked to make more document uh, identifiers of putting these different requested things into the right slot. The fact that that now kind of is. Um, there's a, a natural, I guess, mental alignment with what SNOMED is doing and what SNOMED has in it creates some interesting, I think, opportunities for us to be able to use some of the structure that SNOMED has to give us guidance with regards to how we might, you know, be more consistent with regards to identifying these things are subject matter domains, these things are roles, these things are types of service and things like that. Okay, next slide. So I don't have this wonderful big presentation around this. And, um, and anybody who knows me might have heard me say, I hate asking questions I don't know the answer to. So particularly to a group like this, I mean, I am actually literally blowing it up. The one thing that I generally never do with a group that has a diverse, la and you, know, you haven't been involved in a document ontology to ask you an unanswerable question. But why not? It's four o'clock. <laughs> And the question is, um, the one that I've been constantly prodding here over the past few minutes here, and that is this, um, we continue, as I say, to have some difficulty 
and cleanly understanding how to characterize the different parts, axes, of a request for a document identifier. And, you know, um, and unfortunately I can't kind of, you know, manipulate this, but if you know the document ontology process, um, what we have are subject matter domain, role, type of service, as, as in my opinion, kind of the primary things. There's note type, which is actually quite important because it has structure in it. And then some other pieces to this. Um, and the, the issue that I'd like to get some feedback on, knowing that, <clears throat> so my question is kind of multi-part. One of them is, well, I should also say, Again, if you don't know, the document ontology, uh, ontology is an ontology. It has a hierarchy, right? So there's a structure. It isn't just a flat list of things. And so question one is, um, I'd like some input on how do people use that structure in the document ontology? If anybody is currently using that, it would be really helpful to understand, okay, and I, I can, you know, I, I know how I would answer this. And there are some uses of it that are in play with regards to the in HL7. So I can, I'll speak to that if nobody kind of raises their hand. But it would be really interesting to know, I use the document ontology structure to do X. You know, I look at this, these, remember, these are all loink parts, right? <clears throat> so I, you know, I go and get this loink part and that tells me all these subordinate link parts, which then lead me to a series of documents. Does anybody in here or online do that? And if so, I'd be interested in which of the hierarchies, which of these axes, you know, type service, role, whatever, do you use to do that and for what reason? So does anybody here actually do that and you're right it is hot up here <laughs> anyone here yeah that would be great to get over here. so is anybody online by any chance I won't be surprised if this is a complete swing and a miss but I think you're swinging a miss I yeah. don't see anything online yeah so you know obviously we don't have the wide range of everyone who's a link user but that's not a good sign <laughs> um you know, it, that's not to say that it's not important because we use it when we are asked a question, right? That should, that would be an obvious thing, you know. So in the sense that when a new request for a document identifier comes in, we, we have to look and I go, okay, well, what parts of this are these different axes? What kind of information is important? I always like to ask, well, then how is it going to be used? I mean, why did you need this? What What are you trying to separate it from, right? These are all, should be in some way, reflected by the different segments that, you know, the structure, the different segments that we put into the ontology. We're separating out things that people presumably have told us they want to, I want to identify one of these versus one of these. That's why we have those two things in the ontology. There's the, the groupers, right? So if it's got at least a couple of levels, you presume Right? What would you be presuming? You're presuming that this, someone would be interested in being able to say, I don't really care about the distinctions. I want to just go search for this general thing, and it'll bring all of these other uh, more distinct documents along with it, which is one of the reasons why you heard me say, I think we do need to have subsumption uh, capabilities in terms of the fire process. So, anyway, I'll, I'll give you the answer that, that my hand would have come up. So, it's actually, it's not common, but it's surprisingly common um, uh, that in HL7 and I think some other uh, standards that they use link parts as a way of identifying the kind of thing that someone should be able to send in that particular element. So for example, in, um, in the uh, US core, a fire, so U.S. centric um, way of representing a diagnostic report that that um, that resource. There is a, and this is very common in fire, and a lot of 
uh, clinical models. There's a type code, right? And then there's the thing that's actually being sent where you say this exact document. But it's very common that these models expect organizations to also populate something that is a general categorization of the thing that, you, that you're sending. Similarly, when people are trying to figure out well, what is the list of all of the documents that I can put as a valid value for this particular code that, you know, so I'm supposed to use a document or supposed to use a, um, a diagnostic report and I can use this because the thing that I've made, I already have decided it's link code X, Y, Z. And this, this structure allows me to put that code into the code type, you know, because it's in the value set that I'm allowed to send. So it's a way of telling me, okay, I have one of these, then I should send it in one of these structures, right? Everybody's kind of following that approach. The idea of value sets as a, as a uh, defining characteristic in a sense of the sort of things that should be sent. And it turns out that people like to use, it's not a ton, but they like to use link parts as ways of being able to say the, the general idea, right? the category, that makes sense because these link parts in a document ontology tend to be general statements. And they're because we have a multi-axial structure, they don't specify only one document. They're specifying a lot of documents because they all share that one particular thing. Like they're all, well, a particular note type or they're, uh, they're all radiology or cardiology. And in fact, in, the, in this one example that I'm talking about, they picked a link part for radiology, a loink part for cardiology, and a loink part for pathology as ways of saying those are the three things that belong inside a diagnostic uh, report. And, or, yeah, or did, did I have a diagnostic? No, I got, yeah, I think that's what it's called. Now I just blanked on what it was called. But anyway, so these are some of the things that, that give me pause with regards to, are they the right ways of saying that? Because for example, radiology, that link part, that literal phrase, that little literal string, it, it's two different link parts in link. One of them is associated with clinical tests. It's a class. And one of them is in the document ontology as a subject matter domain. And, and so which one you pick obviously brings different sets of things associated with it. And, you know, this gets back to this question of getting some input into what are the right kinds of things to make subject matter domains and versus type of service or role, for example. Or, you know, another example, I've got, I've got a bunch of it. As you look at this, like there are, we put a bunch of things like, far, like uh, pre prescription is a, uh, is a note type as opposed to a type of service. Um, or, and there's, there's a couple of them that are like that. I mean, obviously note is an obvious note type or uh, consult, is, consult note is an obvious, I mean, there's a structure to that. Is it right to say the structure of a farm, of, of a prescription, should that be a kind of uh, a, a note type or should it be a, a type of service? So I, I know this is exactly why I said, this is foolish for me to stand up and just kind of ex expose my angst because that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you a sense of what's not clear and I'm providing you an opportunity to give us some just thoughts on how do you think the document ontology should do this? And that's why I asked the very first question, which is how do you use it? Because it would be great to take this fresh look at these structures, understanding that we can't throw it all away. There's a lot of it that's actually in regulation. So at least in the U.S. So, I mean, this is one of those incremental change things. But I'd like some input on what kind of 
uh, uses can you imagine with this structure that would give us guidance with regards to how we should tackle trying to line it up? Is this somebody actually, Andrea, maybe? or <laughs> Yes, it's Andrea. Oh, there you <laughs> Andrea, go, go ahead. <laughs> I don't hear you if you're talking. Sorry, there you go. I was just going to say, in the, um, you asked for lab data, or all I asked is they don't have fire functionality and are typically not sending documents like in CDA or fire, um, you know, as far as HL7 Illinois, no, no, currently. Um, and so a lot of that information is still sent in G2 format. Um, it's, it's discrete or synoptic, you know, but, and then downstream the EHR, other information system that's, that's translated or transformed into fire, um, hence the G2 to fire project, um, so that it can be sent out if folks are exchanging that type of data. I will say that um, I know, um, I think Germany is uh, working on fire for lab, um, so if there's anyone present who might have feedback, they might have some input, and also I think Emil and Linda from Kinder Hub Camp Away are at this meeting, they might have input on anything that Kim goes through in the to help you. Okay, that, that's helpful. And you, and you, I haven't gotten input from either of those places, and so they don't tend to, to come, so maybe I can rope, rope them in. I mean, the other thing, I, literally I'll just finish with this because I, I didn't expect you to solve the problem for me, and I, I, I'm opening <clears throat> the door for you to be able to kind of think about this, and, and, and particularly, not necessarily say, oh, I've got the solution. It's really about how do you use the document ontology. And I, and I suspect many of you are at institutions where there are documents that are being exchanged that are identified with link identifiers. And so, you know, my guess, my ask is that you go and talk to those folks and ask them how they use the document ontology as opposed to just the identifier for the document, right, which is pretty straightforward. And, and if you get answers like, yes, we're using a document ontology, um, i.e. we go and, and look for this link part or we look for these combinations that tells us a subset of documents that we're interested in using, it would be very valuable to hear that. Um, you know, right now, I think part of what's driving uh, my interest in this is that I, it seems to me that we should do a better job of aligning the way that the document ontology is structured to the other structures in LOINC. To date, I mean, it's, it's wrong to say it's completely separate, but it's not far from wrong. It's pretty separate. And, you know, evidenced by the fact that we don't even really, I mean, we had to jam all of these axes into other things and you can't even really see it. I mean, when you look at a list of, of things, it's the same presentation. You don't know that you're looking at it at you know a subject matter domain unless you happen to see one that isn't a subject matter domain and then that it's got you know a subject matter domain someplace else and in fact actually one of the things that bothers me a little bit is there's a lot more subject matter domains than roles and yet what's in the display is role and so you don't even know that subject matter domain or role go together so there's a lot of that kind of lack of of presentation fidelity that makes even understanding what's going on there, I think, difficult. But I, I do think that, um, you know, input on how these things are used, input on, gee, it would be really valuable to have the same kind of meanings in the document ontology line up with the meanings that we have in, in uh, lab or, or particularly in clinical, I think, clinical link. Um, that would be, I think, useful for my committee to, to take as, as a starting point. So, the, so um, Rob, there's probably going to be communications out of this meeting around various things, and this can be one of them where we, you know, both attendees and non-attendees, could so we could solicit yeah. some further input for you. That's, that's good. I think you just yeah, have your schedule so here. Our, yeah, our schedule is the second Tuesday of the month. We do tend to meet average, uh, I mean, tend to eat, uh, meet monthly. Um, we won't have a meeting in December, and, and we unfortunately don't always, um, you know, not have a meeting on a particular month. It's oftentimes because there's either nothing nothing pending or 
or I can't make it. <laughs> yep. Clem? Yeah, well, one of the problems of, um, of standards is that you make a standard and it ain't quite right, you know? <laughs> and the people say, oh, they guess our user went crazy, and you change it, and they hate you. So I think you've got a real problem between stability and perfection. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I hear that loud and clear. Um, you know, this is one of those things where there's a, there's a, there's a strong element of just um, philosophical angst that I have that, you know, comes up in the context of some of the discussions around this that, yeah, you know, we've just tamped down over the years and it probably is not a bad idea to keep tamping it down. But well, you might you might be happy to learn there's a mathematical theorem uh, called Gittel's theorem, which proves you really can't make a systematic system that works across <laughs> lots of stuff. So that may make you feel better. Point point taken. All right. Any other oh, insights? <laughs> All right. Thanks, All right. guys. Thank you. Um, thanks to everybody, everybody who was here and took the time to listen, to think about this, to ask us questions, to give us ideas. The brain power in this room is immense and it's hard to bring it all together at one point in time. So we're really uh, appreciative that we had all that. And um, so what time do we start tomorrow, Marjorie? 8.30. 8.30 tomorrow is the starting time. So have a great evening, and we'll see you in the morning. Thank you.